So one of the biggest differences that we need to think about um, when we're transitioning from the section on gen from gender to race um, is understanding that for the most part, as far as the law is concerned, and I really want to focus on that, as far as the law is concerned, gender and race are both immutable, which means they're not changeable characteristics. Uh, legally, that's still the case, though we can obviously see ways in which that is evolving at this point. Um, but as far as the law is concerned in those two areas, those are both what we call immutable characteristics, which means they simply can't be changed. It's not a characteristic that you can get rid of. So if there exists, um, systematic discrimination on the basis of, uh, um, on the basis of, uh, no, nope, there you go. See, technology, isn't it wonderful? Um, so you can't change those. And we obviously recognize that both of them have a, have a significant history of um, discrimination. But when the courts were trying to figure out how to handle discrimination on the basis of race and discrimination on the basis of gender, they very quickly focused on one pretty significant difference. And that is the fact that almost by definition, women aren't a minority, at least numerically. They're not a numerical minority, that they're absolutely a, a, a class, they absolutely have a history of discrimination, but also simultaneously, there's no possible way for them to be a numerical minority, really in, in a generalized sense. So the courts had to wrestle with the idea of in what sense were women a minority? Were they a political minority? Were they economic minority? Were they one of these minorities at some point in history and therefore laws need to take this into account. And this is really the context that we watch the court um, deal with, especially through the 1960s and 70s. Um, we recognize for the most part, or at least the court recognizes for the most part, that there exists some biological differences between men and women, but from a constitutional perspective, the question becomes which of these differences, if any, um, play a legitimate role in government classifications which treat men and women differently and which are inappropriate reflections of gender stereotypes. So there could be a governmental interest in classifying men and women differently in certain regards, but other government classifications could simply be ramifications of gender stereotypes. That is what the court has a very, very difficult time dealing with. And part of that reason is because of the common law background in which um, the United States court system was operating. And that was a background that was borrowed entirely um, from England. And now there's no way to move. It's like the only time I'm gonna have to move this. Hey, look at me go. Um, so let's consider the tradition of what's going on here. Um, the first question that courts really had to deal with starting in the 1960s and 70s is what sort of scrutiny, what sort of classification um, were we going to give um, to laws which discriminated on the basis of gender? And so should gender be a suspect level of classification, um, thus entitled to strict scrutiny like laws that discriminate on the basis of race? Um, and the reason why, and I'll sort of bury the lead here, the reason why the court ultimately doesn't side with suspect classification has to do with that numerical minority question. Um, that since they are by definition not a numerical minority, they're not entitled to suspect classification, but they also realize very quickly they're also not a rational basis classification isn't uh, workable as well. Um, Traditionally in the United States, this won't really shock you, um, women had very near, next to no rights. Um, despite what Thomas Jefferson says in the Declaration of Independence, it, it, it very much was all men are created equal. To give you sort of a, a context, um, when we broke away from England, women in the United States actually lost rights that under the crown, women held more rights than they did under the United States democracy, at least at our founding. 
Um, and part of this reason was we adopted through common law something that was known as coverture. Coverture was in practice and understood to not be good law in England at the time that we separated. But we adopted it as good law moving forward. The doctrine of coverture basically operates like this, that rights are inherently from the man. So in, in, a, in a natural rights realm, that rights are inherently from the man. And when a woman is married, her rights or her ability to access her rights are transferred from her father to her husband. And that is why we literally walk people down the aisle and exchange from um, father to husband is because that was a, it's a sort of a formulistic action now, but it was a legal action um, under these times in which coverture was a, a binding doctrine. Um, and so coverture, and this is according to um, Blackstone's dictionary, coverture uh, made marriage or marriage made husband and wife in one person, that is the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of her husband, under whose wing protection and cover she performs everything. This was the doctrine, legal doctrine, that operated and existed in the United States from its founding, largely until the 1950s and 60s. Um, while there are small blips on the map where women get to exercise uh, more rights, voting perhaps being the most, uh, most, inf most notorious, um, other legal rights still in many cases f uh, existed because of marriage or um, parental rights. Um, so rights that stem to the woman, be, the daughter, because of her father. Um, and so the, the system dominates the United States' understanding uh, of what it means to be female and females exercising their rights. Um, there simply weren't a quest there wasn't a question when laws discriminated on the basis of gender. It was just presupposed. Men had legal rights, and if women had legal rights, they stemmed from her husband. Um, this shouldn't take long for you to see where this goes. If, if a husband dies, it's difficult for the woman to inherit the property under a doctrine of coverture because she does not have the right of inheritance. That gets changed largely during the Civil War era in many states, um, because obviously, not unlike what we're, wit we're witnessing now in terms of the legal landscape, as a, an extremely exogenous event like the Civil War happens and many men are dying, there was a reasonable willingness on behalf of states not to have women become homeless and not be able to inherit their own homes. Um, and so laws in that regard um, changed largely during the Civil War era, but many holdovers still remained in some places. Um, so this doctrine of coverture really, really dominates the court's understanding of what, um, what the law means. And I think that's perhaps most uh, best represented um, uh, in, in the case Bradwell v. State, which happens in 1873. Um, so in Bradwell v. State, uh, to provide you some context uh, in terms of background. Uh, Myra Bradwell uh, was a married woman, but this married woman also had a law degree, although it's not entirely clear from the legal record um, how she attained said degree, especially when we consider that there was very form little formal legal um, training in the United States at the time. Like there weren't many law schools um, in the 1860s and 1870s. Most, um, most lawyers entered the, profession, entered the profession through apprenticeships and not through legal training. So somehow during this time, uh, Myra Bradwell does get legal training, earns a law degree, um, and is only step she needs is a license to practice law. But the only way that she can attain 
such a license is through approval of a panel of judges on the Illinois Supreme Court, the state in which she wanted to practice. Um, so she wants to practice law in Illinois, and the only way that she can actually obtain a license to practice said law is to go before the uh, Illinois Supreme Court uh, and plead her case. Um, the panel of judges turned down her license exclusively on the basis that she was female. But the only reason that this panel gives is that Meyer Bradwell is female and thus cannot uh, have a law license in the state of Illinois. Um, the case ultimately makes its way to the United States Supreme Court. Um, and the Supreme Court decides this case in an 8-1 decision. And the justices of the United States Supreme Court all agree with the panel in Illinois, stating a uh, rejection of her license did not violate the privileges and immunities clause of the 14th Amendment. And that's really what she was bringing suit on. Uh, her argument being that she was being denied um, a privilege uh, of the state that would have been allowed to her in other states. It's also, by the way, not entirely clear um, what other states she was talking about because there weren't, at this time, any states that explicitly um, gave the authority um, to women to become attorneys. Um, but that was the claim that she was making. Um, oh, I, she actually claimed that as a former resident of Vermont, she was she could she was legally licensed to practice in Vermont. The court strikes that down. The court says simply not. Um, uh, and the court says this: uh, the protection designed by that clause has no application to a citizen of a state whose laws are complained of. If the plaintiff was a citizen of the state uh, of Illinois, that provision of the Constitution gave her no protections against its courts or legislation. So basically, they they gut the privileges and immunities clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. They turn on to cite or the to cite the slaughterhouse cases, which should make sense given this context. They're basically saying that the states are sort of immune from the 14th Amendment in this regard. And given the court and given the time span, citing the slaughterhouse cases sort of makes sense, um, at least jurisprudentially. Um, that pretty much ends um, Bradwell's claim. But the only person who dissented, by the way, was Chief Justice Chase but in a practice that is almost e exclusively uncommon today and was fairly uncommon then, Chief Justice states dissents, but he doesn't write a dissent. He does not give us the opinion of why he dissented in the case. He simply voted. Um, so even though, while it may appear that Chief Justice Chase was exceedingly progressive in this regard, it, he wasn't progressive enough to tell us why he thought the way he did. Um, the most notorious part of this case, and really the reason why we cover it in this beginning section, um, is for Justice Bradley. Justice Bradley writes a concurrence. Justice Bradley's concurrence is special. Um, he portrays very systematically how deeply ingrained gender stereotypes were at this time. Um, she claims, uh, he says that on the contrary, the civil law as well as nature herself has always recognized a wide difference in the respective spheres and destinies of man and woman. Man is or should be woman's protector and defender. The natural and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex evidently unfits it for many of the occupations of civil life. The constitution of the family organization, which is founded in the divine ordinance, as well as the nature of things, indicated the domestic sphere as that which properly belongs to the domain and functions of womanhood. The harmony, not to say identity of interests and views, which belong or should belong to the family institution, is repugnant to the idea of a woman adopting a distinct and independent career from that of her husband. So firmly fixed in this sentiment in the founders of the common law that it became a maxim of the system of jurisprudence that a woman has no legal existence separate from her husband who was regarded as her head and representative in the social state. Holy shit. Um, this is a well-respected judge of the Supreme Court 
uh, granted in 1873, um, very much explaining the existence, legal existence of women in the United States, which is to say that it didn't exist. There was no legal existence of women in the United States. One would expect with that much prose that Justice Bradley would be done. He absolutely wasn't. Um, he goes on to say, it is true that many women are unmarried and not affected by any of the duties, complications, and incapacities arising out of the married state, but those, except, those are exceptions to the general rule. The paramount destiny and mission of women are to fulfill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. That is the law of the creator. This gentleman isn't even invoking the constitution. He's invoking the divine law. Um, so it's sort of that natural state. Um, yeah, and this, is the, this is the foundation we're sort of working in. Um, is that very simply, women don't have a legal right to a career. Women don't have a legal right outside of their husband. Um, and, and, and these things are very much the legal background, the underpinning of the entire American judicial system at this time. Um, it shouldn't be shocking to you that it takes 100 years after this case for women's rights to be recognized as the, in the Supreme Court as a thing. Um, and absolutely not. So Michael, let me, let me be very clear here. This is not at all what uh, conservative judges today want to return to. Think about who's appearing in our class on Thursday. The first person to agree to appear for our class on, on Thursday is a conservative woman who sits on the Texas Supreme Court. This isn't what conservatives now envision, or at least should I say legal conservatives now. Absolutely not. There's definitely a segment within our society um, that primarily religious conservatives, and I wouldn't even paint in broad brushstrokes um, the, um, the, sizable, the, the size of this group. There certainly exists a group within society, but even legal conservatives, uh, conservative jurists, I would say even the entirety of the Texas Supreme Court, don't want to revisit this um, at all. It's just simply not where they are. Um, this link I have on the screen to N. Ray Goodell from the Wisconsin Supreme Court two years later pretty much um, is exactly the same. Um, so th this, this idea of legal education um, as being open to women and legal career as being possible for women simply was something that was litigated out of existence. Um, and, and it, it shouldn't shock you just to give sort of a, a context of this, what it meant for women in terms of legal profession. Um, Justice Ginsburg was the first woman, was part of the first class of women at Harvard. She was part of the class that first allowed women to enter. Justice O'Connor was the first class at Stanford that allowed women to enter. But just take that context and do you think that they were the best legal minds that time had produced? The fact that two of them made it to the United, the two of them made it to the United States Supreme Court? Absolutely not. They were the first two that actually had the, the doors open for them. There were countless women, perhaps even Maya Bradwell herself, um, who had this avenue that simply wasn't available to them 